So let me go ahead and get started as it's top of the hour here. Welcome to Are You Ready for All Electric Home Heating and Cooling? My name's Al Hibner. I'm a lifelong Penfield resident. And in my home, I have an air source heat pump over my, my head here in the back and in the lower level. And I have a ground source heat pump system uh, providing uh, heat and cooling for our upper upper level for the entire upper house. So uh, Katie Rigg, I pass it to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Al. Uh, hi, I'm Katie Rigg, and um, we have a geothermal system at our house, and I'm um, excited to talk to you about that. I'm also the um, a co-lead for Color Penfield Green, which is uh, one of the partners bringing you this class this evening. And if, if what we're doing is interesting to you, if you'd like to participate, we'd love to build our network. So um, uh, check us out at colorpenfieldgreen.org. I'll pass it to Igor. And I'm looking for on mute button. Um, my name is Igor. I'm part of Color Pencil Green. My house has a air source heat pump and a heat pump water heater. And I'll pass it to Bob. There we go. Thanks, Igor. Um, I'm going to talk about our air source heat pump that we put in our house about a year and a half ago. And I'm a member of the Penfield Energy and Environmental Committee. I also want to introduce uh, Cass Tilleman, who's here tonight, also from Col a member of Color Penfield Green. And um, yep, I'm sorry, Cass, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, off mute. Yes, you're on mute. I'm Cass Tillman. I'm a new member of Color Penfield Green, and I'm actually here as a participant in this session. Excellent. Thanks to everybody from Color Penfield Green. And I'd like also now to introduce, uh, have Matt Corona introduce himself. I'm not sure if Raphael's on the call, but Matt, uh, take it away. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Matt. I am the uh, campaign manager for the Heat Smart Monroe campaign, and I'll tell you more about that later, so don't worry about it yet. Um, I work for a local um, ro uh, Rochester-based climate-focused nonprofit called the Climate Solutions Accelerator, and Heat Smart is our program. Um, and I'll tell, more, tell you more about that later. Great, thanks Matt. Um, tonight we're going to be uh, introducing you to the, the whole subject of clean heating and cooling using electricity instead of natural gas and fossil fuels. Matt will have a session on uh, Heat Smart Monroe, what it is, and defining heat pumps and helping us to understand what kinds are available, uh, as well as links that we can follow to, to get engaged with uh, his program. And then four of us, uh, myself, Katie, Bob, and Igor, are going to go ahead and uh, provide you with information about our systems. All of us have these heat pump systems, as we've told you. So we can't wait to tell you some of the uh, skinny, some of the good things, and uh, some of the not so good things sometimes about our systems that we've been living with for a couple of years. Uh, next action steps we'll close with. And I do want to make sure you know that the PDF document that contains all these slides is in the chat right now. So if you click on that, you can download that to your computer. I will also be following up with everybody that registered by email tomorrow, and I'll enclose a copy of this, uh, the slides as well. And in the slides, all the links, every, one of the hyperlinks, if you open up the PDF document, you have to download it first uh, or save it to your computer. But if you open it up, all the links can be clicked on to take you to the appropriate locations. In our appendices, uh, I've included links to a series of articles that I've written uh, about my journey toward becoming all electric. So let's get started. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit about where we are right now. This is, this is really pretty current data. And if you look at the uh, area in, in red right now, let's kind of dissect that. This is from the 
U.S. Energy Information Administration as of January 11th. And at that time, uh, if you look at the left-hand column, um, they were predicting that uh, energy costs for heating oil, natural gas, and propane were all going to be about 30 to 40% over the baseline average prices, base case forecast, as they call it. And if you look at electricity, 5%. That's a big difference. That alone kind of says, hey, we might want to consider, uh, you know, switching to all electric appliances away from fossil fuels. And then they, they talk about the warmer than forecast and colder than forecast. So this is current data from the government. And I just want to emphasize to you that New York State is considering legislation, is considering funding in its budget. Um, ways to reduce CO2 emissions across the state. And, and New York State has been, has considered actually putting a price per ton on CO2 emissions and equivalents. Now that hasn't passed yet, but it's been considered. And something like that still could happen. It still could happen. Now it would also entail returning some of those revenues back to low and moderate income households to make them whole so that they, they don't suffer uh, because of higher energy prices from fossil fuels. But the same thing is being considered at the national level. Right now in the Build Back Better Act, the climate provisions may be some of the only parts of that bill that actually survive, depending upon whether Joe Manchin says they can or not. <laughs> okay. And in that Build Back Better bill, we know for a fact, Katie and I especially, uh, because of the work that we do with Citizens Climate Lobby, that they are considering putting a price on CO2 uh, emissions and also refunding some of that revenue back to low and moderate income households. So this could still happen. We're not sure. You know, nobody knows what Joe Manchin, what's in his heart. Nobody knows. <laughs> and bottom line, all signs are pointing to the need to reduce our net uh, our CO2 and equivalent emissions to net zero by 2050, by 50%, a reduction of 50% by 2030. We just have to keep on that path. We have to get on that path in order to avoid the worst ravages of, uh, cli of, of, of global warming. So pretty sure fossil fuel prices are going to continue in the short term and long term to increase. So you know, that's going to spur the technology innovation we need to find clean, uh, renewable solutions. So what can you do? And part of that answer to that question is why you are here tonight, we think. So I had a chance to um, look at a lot of information that's come out from a gentleman named Saul Griffith, who started a organization called Rewiring America, whose goal is to convince us to electrify everything. If you have a gas car, a gas furnace, a gas hot water heater, a gas dryer, a gas stove that need replacement, his whole idea is just replace it with, with an all electric, an efficient all electric appliance or automobile. That's, that's the story here. You can read a little bit about his background. He's done a lot of work with the government. Actually, he's gonna tell you that himself in this, in this particular video. So let me make sure that I am sharing sound. I'm gonna stop for just a second. Share again, make sure that we are sharing sound and we should be ready to play that video. Sadly, people have the impression that we can't fix climate and still have the American dream. That's not true. reality is we only need half as much energy as we think. We don't have to shrink our cars, we don't have to shrink our homes to achieve that. Right now you think that sounds too good to be true, but here's how you make it true. We need to electrify nearly everything. In 2018 I worked with the Department of Energy to map the entire US energy system. Where energy comes from and where it goes. Everything from how much energy your toaster uses to how much energy it takes to make steel.
It is really amazing just how much energy is wasted. The wasted energy we're talking about isn't really the wasted energy of forgetting to turn your kitchen light off. It's in the way we make and produce energy. More than 60% of the fuels that we use to generate our electricity get wasted as heat. More than 80% of the energy we stick into our cars in the form of gasoline or diesel is also wasted. If we electrify everything, we eliminate a huge amount of the waste, we don't need to shrink our cars, we don't need to turn the thermostat down, and we use less than half of the energy we currently do. We've got to electrify our trucks and our cars, we've got to electrify our homes, our furnaces, our hot water heaters, even the way we cook. And then we need to supply that electricity with our clean, non-wasteful sources, with wind, with solar, with hydro, and with other clean energy systems. And if we did that, we're going to save every business and every home money. Wind and solar are the cheapest forms of electricity going onto the grid today. Solar on your roof can be the cheapest energy source that we have ever had. If we use all of this cheap energy, there's an opportunity here for us all to save money while improving our energy systems. Think about that for a second. The future can be awesome. We can have cleaner water, we can have cleaner air, we can have cleaner skies and a better environment. And we can save thousands of dollars per year in every household. Why do I know America can do this? It's because America, uniquely in the world, has a history of taking on audacious projects. Solving the Great Depression. Fighting World War II and winning it for the Allies. Launching man into outer space. If America goes bold and big in that manner, and we do it focused on electrification of the economy, we can be the first country in the world to truly address climate change at scale and on the time frame we need. America is blessed with incredible resources and can easily run on clean and renewable electricity. America can be electric. Our future can be electric. Let's rewire America. So Saul Griffith is a proponent of almost what sounds like too good to be true, but I'm going to tell you right now, and I hope to do this in my case study, I'm with him. You can have your cake and eat it too. So you hang on for my session and several of the others, and let me prove that to you. And I'll prove it to you with actual numbers, kilowatt hours spent. Okay. So um, what, right now, what I'd like to do is turn the session over to uh, Matt Corona for Heat Smart Monroe. Penfield is Heat Smart. Matt. Thanks, Al. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll be covering all about the Heat Smart campaign, uh, how it can be uh, useful to you and, and what we're all about, uh, resources we offer. Um, talk about heat pumps themselves, uh, the, go over the basics of how they work, and um, and we'll also talk about how to get started with the Heat Smart campaign and, and uh, figure out whether your home would make sense for a heat pump and what type of heat pump. So uh, Heat Smart Monroe is part of, so we're um, a program, again, from the Climate Solutions Accelerator, but we're funded by NYSERDA. NYSERDA is, um, stands for New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Um, it's basically a state agency that's helping to move the state toward clean and renewable energy um, in a number of ways. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways that has to be done. Um, so, <clears throat> but one of those ways is the, uh, you know, heating and cooling of your home. And so um, we're focused, this campaign is focused on uh, home energy efficiency and clean heating and cooling technology. So we're a clean heating and cooling community campaign. Um, and there's a bunch of other heat smart programs all across the state. Um, not every county is covered, but we don't have like territory per se, like, you know, it's not competitive. So, um, you know, you could definitely reach out even if your county isn't covered or if your family, your family across the state and their counties that covered the, you know, the closest heat smart to ca campaign to them will be happy to help. And um, this map is available online on the NYSERDA website. Uh, there's a link to it in this PowerPoint. So you can go and check that out and find your, you know, help, you know, family members or whoever find their Heat Smart campaign. Um, or you can just get in, combat, in contact with me and I, I can refer you to the, uh, the campaign manager for them. Um, yeah, next slide. 
And now Al is going to talk about the so, uh, campaign running in Penfield. Uh, all of us love talking about our heat pump systems. Uh, absolutely. Here in Penfield, the four of us. But we're doing this not only to let you know how much we love them and how efficient they are, but also we're doing this as a collaboration of the town of Penfield. We, we approached the town, color Penfield green, approached the town as well as Heath Smart Monroe to put together a collaborative effort to do two things, educate our residents as we're doing tonight. And this is being recorded so we can reach even larger audiences, but also it's a bit of a competition. Uh, NYSERDA is promoting a clean energy communities program. And if you haven't heard about it, uh, you gain points by doing certain high impact action items like this. This is a high impact action item. We're running a clean heating and cooling and energy efficiency community campaign. Um, if we get five of our Penfield residents, three to purchase heat pump systems and at least two to purchase energy um, weatherization and energy saving services, then the town of Penfield stands to gain points, uh, 500 points, and better yet, $5,000 for sustainability projects of the town's choosing. So Bob will be working on the Energy and Environmental Advisory Committee to talk about possibilities like what, maybe buying some more EV chargers <laughs> for, for the town facilities, whatever. So it is a combination effort, both education as well as doing good things for the town. So we're gonna be asking you if we can follow along with you over the next few months, you can opt out at any time. We don't, don't need to bother you if you don't want to be. But if you do get inspired to um, weatherize your home or add a heat pump, that counts. That counts for points and money. And we're going to love to hear from you about that. So that's the campaign. And actually, I talked all through that, man. So we'll skip to the next slide. So <laughs> You're good. That sounds good. Cool. So... Um, you know, on, on the back end, Heat Smart Monroe is really the, uh, you know, kind of project management part of, of this, uh, collaboration effort. So, um, you know, ideally we, you know, and part of the resources of Heat Smart is to help you guide you through the process, help you find contractors that make sense for your situation. Um, and so, and yeah, so, um, you know, basically what we're recommending for homes to do is, you know, because we know we need to elect for everything. Um, ultimately with a heat pump, we need to get homes heat pump ready and then help them to get a heat pump. Uh, so before you get a heat pump, ideally you'd like to make building envelope improvements to your home, um, mainly air sealing and insulation. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to help the heat pump to run more efficiently. Um, heat pumps run best when they're in a very tight space. Um, and if your home hasn't been sealed or insulated uh, in a long time, it's uh, uh, really important to do that first before you get a heat pump, um, if you can. So then once you've done that, you can get a heat pump. Um, and so we'll talk tonight about air source and ground source heat pumps. I'll explain you know, the differences uh, between those and, and what might make sense for your home. Um, and then there's also heat pump hot water heaters, not mentioned on here are heat pump dryers and uh, you know, clothes dryers, and then also, um, I don't, are there heat pump dishwashers? I don't even know, maybe. Um, <laughs> no, actually, well, in that case, the water would be heated by um, the hot water heater, so. But anyway, um, next slide. <laughs> so what is a heat pump? Uh, a heat pump is, uh, you know, everyone already has one, actually. Um, it's called your refrigerator. And so uh, if you put your hand behind your refrigerator, there's a little bit of heat that's coming out the back. The heat pump is pumping the heat outside of out of your refrigerator. So um, you can take that same technology and apply it to your whole house. And um, and basically, it's it's a lot like an air conditioner, except you can flip it in reverse. Um, and there are a few different designs, and we'll talk more about that. Um, you might ask, how does a heat pump um, heat your house in the winter? Um, the basic answer is that there is still thermal energy outside in the winter, even in the dead of winter. Um, and so what a heat pump does is it manipulates uh, a coolant fluid and can still extract heat from that very cold air um, and move it into your house. So um, they're all year heating and cooling solution. 
Next slide, please. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, there are two, you know, the two types, there's air source and ground source heat pumps. Um, that, those are the big basic categories. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of different models, different form factors within those groups. So over on the left, you've got air source heat pumps. Um, the main difference between, uh, you know, traditional, oh, there's a lot of differences, but one of the main differences between uh, like natural gas equipment, fossil fuel based heating equipment is that those systems burn fuel to create heat. Um, heat pumps are different in that they don't create any heat themselves. They just move heat from one place to another. They pump the heat. Um, and then the, this name, air source or ground source, implies where they're moving that heat from. Um, so air source heat pumps look a lot like existing air conditioners do. It's a shame that more air conditioners aren't already heat pumps because they're not all that different at all. Um, so, uh, you know, basically for an air source heat pump, you've got the outdoor uh, unit, looks like a box with a fan in it, um, a lot like an air conditioning condenser unit. Um, and then you've got the indoor unit. So you can, you know, there's a couple of different form factors for air source heat pumps. If you have ductwork, you can basically just have a ductwork, uh, a, a uh, air handler in the basement. You wouldn't have one of these mini split units that you see right here. Um, over up on the wall, that's if you don't have duct work, you'd have a ductless mini split and I'll, I'll show some more designs for those in a little while. Um, over on the right, you've got ground source heat pumps. Um, so on the inside, they're pretty simple. You just got the air handler in the basement. Um, that, that's what that big box with the ductwork connected is. And then um, outside, instead of, the, uh, instead of the box, you'd have um, either a horizontal or a vertical loop field. Um, and this is basically where the heat would be exchanged with the ground. Um, if you have enough land for a horizontal loop field, which is kind of what you see being halfway through installed over here on uh, the bottom right, um, you don't need a ton of land, but uh, a lot of homes probably in Penfield. Penfield's probably in a place where some might be able to do horizontal, some might be able to have to do vertical. But either way, you'd have either that horizontal well or horizontal loop field, or you'd have a drill, drill rig like you see up here um, that would have to drill a vertical well um, and a varying depth depending on the location. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, but either way, you'd, uh, they're both ground source. Um, and by the way, ground source is the same thing as geothermal heating and cooling. A lot of people have heard of that before. Um, ground source, they're synonymous, so it's the same thing. Um, and then heat pump hot water heaters can be either ground source or air source. Um, you'd have a ground source heat pump hot water heater if you also had a ground source system for your house. So they would be able to loop together. And then there are air source heat pumps that uh, are basically independent units. Next slide, please. Uh, I see a question. I'm gonna stop and answer it really quick. Can a horizontal field be put in a yard which also has a septic system. Presumably, you'd need a different ground space than the leach field, right? Um, I am not so sure about that. Um, there is no, so, you know, the loop field is a closed system. So there's no, like, nothing being exchanged with the ground in terms of fluid, just the heat. Um, so maybe that's possible. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Does anyone here have a septic system in their yard as well? Yeah, um, we do. The leach field bed is usually 24 inches below the surface. So the uh, ground loop would be way below that. So I don't know. It couldn't be put in after the uh, leach field was in. And if it was put in before, a lot of times if you have disturbed earth for a uh, leach system, it has to go through a uh, seasonal cycle so the ground settles. Um, but it probably wouldn't be a very good idea, you know, to do that. Um, I don't know you know, if the health department would weigh in on that, but the depths, you know, it's 24 inches. And then for a trenched 
a uh, ground loop it's anywhere from six to eight feet more than likely uh when the geothermal company came in they would avoid the leach field like the plague and they would do it in the front mm -hmm. if it was in the back and they do it in the back if it was in the front so it would be avoided and they would drill a vertical well 500 feet for 250 feet <laughs> okay but they would drill vertical wells to stay completely away from the leach field they they busted through my fifth, fifth 1955 leach field but i have a sewer system so no problemo. It leaked right into the, the trench. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, they would avoid it like the plague, I do believe. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And, you know, you'd probably have to, um, if you didn't have enough space outside of that, you'd probably just go for a vertical well. So um, it's likely that uh, if you have a sizable yard, even with a space that's not covered by the leach field, you'd probably still be able to do geothermal. But... Um, we could totally have someone do an assessment of your land and figure that out for you. So, um, yeah. So back to the presentation. This uh, this is sort of a basic design of a um, of a geothermal system. You know, you've got this is a ducted system. Almost all geothermal systems are going to be ducted. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, you've got the air handler in the basement. That's that green box there. And then it distributes heat to the ductwork, um, which then to the house. And it's connected to the loop field. This is a horizontal loop field out in the yard. And that's where the heat is exchanged. Next slide, please. Um, this is a uh, basic ducted air source heat pump system. Um, very similar to the last design, except instead of got the um, coolant line going to the horizontal loop field, it's now going to the outdoor air source heat pump unit. And it's basically a heat exchanger in a box with a fan on it. Um, pretty simple. Um, it's both a condenser and, a, and an evaporator in this scenario because it's able to move heat in and out of the house. Um, and then I will also show you a ductless air source heat pump system in case you have no ductwork. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is this is the system designed for you. Probably, if you have no ductwork, the alternative would be to put ductwork in, um, which is, you know, a significant cost in a lot most scenarios. Um, so you can see instead of the air handler now and the ductwork, you've got the outdoor unit this time for air source heat, for an air source heat pump. Um, the indoor unit is here instead of the air source, instead of the air handler, it's a, a ductless mini split. Um, mini split is a pretty common term. A lot of people have heard that. Um, and uh, you know, basically the outdoor units connected directly to the mini split. There are a few different form factors for those mini splits. Um, and you don't really need to read all this information up at the top. Uh, these these um, designs came from the uh, NYSERDA, uh, again, put together a heat pump planner. And so it's a really fantastic resource. Um, I've linked it in this document as well. So um, you can totally check that out after. It's got different home designs and different sort of heat pumps and a lot of good questions to ask contractors. So I, I totally recommend taking a look if you can. Um, and so those mini splits again down here on the right, you can see they have a few different form factors. You know, you've got the sort of radiator down in the ground looking one. You've got the one up on the wall. Um, it looks like a lot of ductless air conditioners. And then um, sometimes you can have the, uh, the uh, mini split unit as like a smaller air handler in the wall to distribute to some duct work. And if there's a particular part of the house that has that. Um, and so next slide, please. So to touch on some of the differences um, from a user perspective, you know, like living in the house, they're gonna be very similar. They're both, both system designs are gonna provide adequate uh, heating and cooling um, throughout the whole year. Uh, air source heat pumps specifically, just want to point out that there are cold climate air source heat pumps, which are, I'm talking about cold climate air source heat pumps tonight. There are air source heat, heat, pump, heat pumps that are not designed to work in this climate. Um, and, you know, I would, if you're looking for a whole house heating solution, make sure you're, you're looking at a cold climate air source heat pump. Um, and, you know, if you're working with the companies that we're with, you know, it's, I can totally help you make sure that that's the case. Um, but uh, yeah, there are, you know, definitely non-cold climate air source heat pumps, but 
you know, no good contractor would, you know, you don't have to like be careful about that. It should be made clear to you, which, which one you're talking about when working with a contractor. But um, just to be clear, I'm talking about cold climate air source heat pumps. Um, okay. <laughs> they both do, hot, both types of systems are able to do hot water heating and cooling or just heating really. Um, and uh, you'll, you, with either system type, you also get the co-benefits of, you know, reducing your carbon emissions, um, getting off of fossil fuels. There's a lot of research now going into the side effects of burning fossil fuels in our homes, uh, particularly in the case of a um, gas stove, for example, where it's like burning fuel right in front of your face. Uh, who would have thought? It's not that great for you um, in air quality. So um, yeah, you get the co-benefits, of course, and uh, increased comfortability as well, um, because the systems provide much more even heat um, instead of kicking on and off like a natural gas furnace does, it runs constantly um, at a stable level. So um, the real difference is in the cost. Uh, and I really call air source and ground source uh, heat pumps two different investments. Um, so what I mean by that is air source systems uh, are less expensive up front. They cost a similar price to if you had to do new natural gas and air conditioning in your house. Um, so it won't cost you a ton more than doing that, um, you know, give or take a few thousand dollars, um, maybe. So, but that's always changing. Um, the, the, you know, the other thing, it, even though it's cheaper up front, you know, the operating cost is, is similar to natural gas and air conditioning as well. Um, you know, as Al pointed out, this is always changing. And this year, natural gas and, and other fossil fuel prices are up quite a bit compared to electricity. So I'm very interested to see the, how the data plays out um, in the differences after this season and into the future. Um, and, you know, I think it's very likely that the cost of natural gas as well as other fossil fuels is going to increase in the long term. So um, even though the cost to operate an air source system today isn't dramatically cheaper, than natural gas, I think that's likely to change in the long term. Um, and these are 20 year decisions you're making, at least in your home. So, you know, you've got to really think about the long term. You can't just think about what's happening right now. Um, ground source systems, on the other hand, uh, cost quite a bit more up front, typically about double the cost of an air source heat pump, um, but they're significantly cheaper to run. Um, so, in the long term, uh, you'll see a return on your investment compared to other options. Um, because they're much more efficient. And part of the reason for that is because the ground under, uh, under at least a few feet of earth is a stable temperature all year round. And so they're able to be more efficient than air source heat pumps because they're not using the cold, cold air outside in the winter, but they're using the 50 degree uh, ground um, around in and around your home. So in terms of lifespan, um, the Air source heat pumps last a similar amount of time to traditional natural gas equipment, uh, you know, give or take 20 years. Ground source heat pumps last a, a little bit longer. Um, and the replacement cost isn't the same as the initial investment because you don't have to re-drill the wells. You don't have to redig the loop field. Um, so, you know, it's uh, not, a, not as large of a replacement cost. Um, if you have ductwork, it's generally easier to go for an air source heat pump. Um, you can do a ground source heat pump if you have a, a radiator, if you have a, um, a, ra a radiator system or radiator hot water distribution, but um, you don't get the cooling from the ground source heat pump in that case. So, um, you know, if you want to get all the benefit of the ground source, you either have to install ductwork or you could just go for an air source system. Um, so. Air source heat pumps are a little more flexible. They can work in any home. They can do ducted or ductless. Um, lot size is also a little bit of a constraint for geothermal. Um, in Penfield, you likely won't, you know, be in the position where you can't do ground source. You probably might have to do um, vertical wells, depending on where you are. Um, but uh, we can help you figure that. What's going to make figure out what's going to make the most sense for your yard. Um, and then the annual checkup uh, is a little bit of a downside for air source heat pumps. You have to get them checked up fairly, um, you know, consistently year to year, which isn't really much different from a, from a natural gas furnace because you also have to do that. But uh, um, ground source has a, a little bit less of a, a maintenance requirement um, because it's not exposed to the elements constantly like air sources with the outdoor unit. Next slide, please. And I also, I forgot this time too. I forgot to bring up my spokes rodent, Doug Burroughs, 
right here who's on my shoulder. Uh, he's our spokesperson because he stays warm all year round um, in his burrow, just like other burrowing animals do. Um, and they, they draw on the stable temperature of the earth underground to stay nice and toasty all year round. And it's the same principle that your ground source heat pump uses to keep you affordably and efficiently <laughs> heated and cooled in the, or just heated really in the winter, probably. Um, and so just to summarize, to touch on the, the points again, why heat pumps, we need to electrify everything um, as we pointed out. And if we're gonna do that, we might as well pick heat pumps because they're super energy efficient. Um, they can, for every, you know, meet 200 to 400% efficient means for every uh, amount, every unit of uh, electric energy that gets used to power the system, they are able to uh, move two to four, or in the case of ground source, even more than that, times as much energy and thermal, thermal energy from the outside. Um, they both provide heating and cooling. So you only have to remember to replace one thing every so often instead of two. Um, they can improve your indoor air quality and they will definitely reduce your bills if you're heating with propane oil or electric resistance. Um, and also if, if you're on natural gas, it's, you know, I just want to plan again that fossil fuel, fuel prices are probably only going to increase in the long term compared to electricity. Um, and in the case of a air, ductless air source heat pump, you can have multi zones um, and everything can be remote controlled. So they're very convenient. And uh, the reduced environmental, environmental impact, which is uh, you know, important to a lot of us. And uh, basically this is part of the benefit of, of working with the Heat Smart campaign is you can help make sure that, that you get the incentives that you're entitled to. I just got a notification to plug my laptop in one second, <laughs> two seconds. Well, man, is away. I just want to make sure that you know that that this is all a nonprofit effort. There's no commissions involved. We are residents who care about uh, the environment, and uh, you know we're just we're not doing this for for money or profit or anything of that nature. This is all goodwill to our our fellow citizens. Yeah, and to add on to that, uh, and I just uh, really want to appreciate the Penfield folks for for helping out doing this, but. Um, just, you know, on that note, Heat Smart as well is, is totally fund, grant funded by the state. So we don't make any commission or any money off of the interactions we have with our, our clients. We are really just there to be a public resource um, and help people make sure that they're getting the incentives that they're entitled to. Um, so there's a no cost home energy assessment. I, I recommend every home starts there as a way to prioritize your options, figure out if there's opportunity to do building envelope improvements before you install the heat pump. Not every home will have to. Some homes have already done it. Some homes have not. So um, it's important to start there. Um, I'll answer your question is when I finish the slide. Um, there are grants available for installation and air sealing. Some are income-based, some are not. So it's good. We can I can help you screen and, uh, for the grants and figure out which ones make sense for you. Um, there's a awesome geothermal federal tax credit, which I hope gets increased at some point. Um, I know it just got extended through 2023 and then uh, there, so there's that, which covers 26% of the total project costs, which is at no cap, which is really awesome. Um, there are also utility rebates for heat pumps, which give or take cover about 20% of the total cost. Uh, they scale up the size and um, it's different for every home, but um, very, you know, pretty significant rebates available. And then there is some great financing, which you know you can allow you to do the project for no money out of pocket, even in some cases. And uh, and there's more. Sometimes there's local grants that come out, and we try to stay on top of that stuff. So if there's anything temporary that's around, we can help make sure that you get that as well, if it makes sense for you. Uh, okay, so the question's been answered. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, Katie. Next slide, please. Um, so how do people typically move through the, the, the program? Um, you know, first you do go out of your way to come to an event like this or, you know, do some Googling and find us. Um, then you can schedule uh, a no cost uh, consultation basically over the phone. We'd spend about 30 minutes to go through um, details about your home, what you're interested in doing. We can 
see which uh, grants and incentives you might be able to qualify for. Then you can schedule a free home energy audit with uh, either one of our partner contractors um, or any contractor that can do it. You know, I, I would love for you to work with our partners and there's some benefits to that. I'll tell you more um, in a second, but uh, you know, you could schedule a home energy audit. That would be where you get, um, you know, a contractor spends about two hours at your home, um, you know, making ultimately would produce some recommendations for building envelope improvements and perhaps replacing or upgrading the heating system. You can then review those recommendations. I'm happy to help you do that and figure out if the things that are recommended make sense for your home, make sure that that's the case. And then you can decide what to do. You can totally install the system or install whatever they recommend or not. It's no obligation. Um, we just wanna make sure that uh, the information is in your hands. Next slide. Um, so program resources we offer, uh, it's, me, it's mostly me as a as an energy advisor, but um, that's a really great resource because I can help you through the whole process. Make sure that um, you know the grants that you, if you can use any of them, that we help you apply, get everything in. Um, you know, make sure that the the contractors you're working with are able to use the state incentives that um, that those are offered to you, and that um, you know our contractors basically. I'll, I'll have them on the next slide, so I'll tell you who they are, but. Um, we did a, a vetting process to pick them. There are smaller contractors that are heat pump specialists. Um, they do most of their work with heat pumps. Um, and we pick them because they're, uh, they're affordable for that reason, because they do most of their business with heat pumps. And um, we touch base with them weekly. So it gives me a chance to act as an advocate for you as a customer of theirs and make sure that um, all of the, um, the recommendations are going to make sense for your home and help hold them accountable. Um, so if there's any issues, I'm happy to help you work through those. Um, and here's my contact information. And I've also left links to the nice sort of heat pump planner, which those great graphics came from earlier, and a link to the income-based incentives. So if you want to go check whether you might qualify for those, you can totally do that. Um, even outside of those income-based incentives, there are still grants for everybody. So um, that's not the only thing available, but if you do qualify, it's an awesome, awesome resource. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of money available for low to moderate income households. It's great. And uh, these are our contracting partners right now. Um, if you're thinking about air source heat pumps, Wise Home Energy is awesome. Eco Energy also does air source heat pumps. Um, those are our two air source partners. And then ACES, and Eco both do geothermal as well. Um, ACES also does solar. So if you have any interest in solar, they're a great solar contractor. Um, you can find more information and links to those contractor websites on our website, um, which I've linked right there, our installer partners page. Um, and if you don't want to do any research, I can. you can totally just talk to me and I'll help you pick the contracting partner that's gonna make sense for you um, based on the work that I know they do. So totally don't even have to think about it if you don't want to but the information is out there. There are plenty of other contractors as well. We are not trying to say these are the only good contractors out there. Um, although I would highly recommend whatever contractor you do pick, if you're looking at a heat pump, um, making sure that they're specialized in heat pumps. There are a lot of contractors out there that um, don't do the best job with heat pumps, we'll say. So, um, and if you wanna to talk to me about it, I, you know, even outside of our partner group, I can recommend um, you know, solid contractors. So get in touch. Um, and so I will leave you with, start with a no cost, no obligation home energy assessment. It's easy and free. Um, and, you know, that would really give you the place to start and you can figure out what's going to make the most sense for your home. I'm happy to help you set that up. Um, all you have to do is go to the Heat Smart website and you can set up a time for us to have a home call and we can talk about the, all that and get you started. The link is right there. We're going to take a, a moment break here to uh, see if there are any more questions coming from our folks tonight, Jody and Chris and Merrick and uh, let's see, Steve, uh, Cass, any, any questions at this point? I did have one other question. Uh, my brother has a house in Fairport and um, I don't know the details of their heat pump situation, but what I understood is that he has a heat pump that keeps it cool on the warm days and keeps it warm on the cool days 
but is not enough to keep up with when it's really cold and then when it's really hot. And so he also has a furnace and an air conditioner. And I'm wondering if that's uh, outdated technology or whether that's typical or what more you might know about that. We're going to have Igor explain in his case study incredible answers to that question. So thank you for asking it. And Igor will be up shortly here. So <laughs> I'm going to give a, a quick a quick just overview to, to answer that question, though, is that what I alluded to earlier, there are cold climate heat pumps and um, non-cold climate heat pumps. And it sounds like what you're I, I'm sorry, I don't remember how you related your friend, maybe, but um, it sounds like he has a, a non-cold climate heat pump, in which case those work down to freezing temperatures. Um, and the problem where they don't work in this climate is that the uh, water condenses on the outside and freezes. So they, uh, they, they can't work in under freezing temperatures. But cold climate heat pumps have a workaround to this, which Igor will talk about. Um, so it depends upon what system you install. Um, and if you want to figure out which one would make sense for you, I can help you do that. Any other questions before we move on to the case studies? Great, there'll be more chances for questions. Sorry, Steve, just unmuted. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, yeah no, I wanna Steve. jump in here to stretch this out. Uh, the one uh, question I had is that, uh, it is mentioned that, it, uh, you know, it'd be expensive to put in ducks uh, if you install a heat source, uh, is there ever a case in which you, if you have a uh, poor duct work to just go to a ductless system from uh, a currently a uh, ducted furnace? It's, it's not unheard of. Um, I would say if you, there might be like small modifications you can make to the duct work rather than just like forgetting it. Um, but I think starting with the home energy audit would probably help you figure that out. Um, because if you're working with one of our partners, at least they'll definitely during the audit also assess your house for, you know, capabilities for heat pump, if you're interested in like replacing your system at all anyway. So um, yeah, I would say hard to say for sure without seeing the whole design and, and if there are any issues, but um, yeah, it could go either way. I've seen Thank people you. do that. I've seen people do, if the house is built poorly and the ducts are bad, it's easier to throw one outside unit and then you put mini units in each room. Yeah. And then you just bypass the whole thing completely. I, I've thought about that too, because my house has some crappy ducts in some places. <laughs> yeah. Igor, uh, take it away. You're okay, it's my turn. I'll answer the cold weather one. You actually have to make sure the heat pump you pick is certified for cold weather to get my surgery dates. So there is a list of Northeast qualified pumps. So it has to be on that list or you're not even gonna get the money. So that, that part is very important. Um, okay, um, slides. Now we can talk about my house. Uh, I was actually doing all this before HeatSmart. So it's all my trials and errors and doing it on my own. So we, the house we're in is a uh, Ryan built 1983. So it's a pretty poorly built house, I would say. Uh, we didn't know any better when we bought it and we've slowly improved it over uh, the years. So one thing we did in early on, we did energy assessment, we got blower door test. And it came back, the numbers are in the middle, but basically it came back as 1500, which is not terrible, but it's not very good. And then over the years, we've progressively made it tighter and tighter. Uh, we did a lot of air sealing first, mostly tops of the walls in the attic. We did uh, in um, in a basement. Then we did uh, we blew in some insulation in the attic and insulating the basement significantly with rigid foam. And that one I actually did myself. That was fairly easy to do. So rigid foam against a uh, brick followed by uh, R13. So my basement is tight and air sealed to the top of the house is tight and air sealed and that brought things down quite a bit and about half of the leakage i list here all the installers i've used uh, again they were outside of the program but uh, i think now they are at least part of nicer now uh as a result of all this and the result of all the upgrades i'll describe we barely use any gas so i my setup is a hybrid i still have a gas furnace, but it uses none to maybe three, four turns a year. So barely anything. 
Uh, we do use a lot of electricity because the house is all electric. I also have electric cars, so all of it together makes high usage. We produce a little bit of our own. It's not enough to cover the whole thing. We make about third of our consumption. Uh, next slide. So this is a timeline. Uh, we kind of started minimizing gas usage when we first moved in. We just did not put any gas appliances in. We picked electric stove, we picked electric dryer. At that point, we just had a water heater and a furnace. Did all the improvements to the house, made it tighter, and then the water heater became too leaky because any time the house got too tight for the initial draft gas appliances. So we did the detour and put a tankless water heater and I have a separate slides on that one because it could bring its own combustion area in. Then we put solar on and then in 2019, we made a whole bunch of improvements to the HVAC system. We actually made a hybrid heat pump. Uh, so we kept the furnace that we had as an air handler, we upgraded the blower in it to allow for low speed ventilation and then a couple other speeds. And then we replaced the air conditioner with heat pump. We kept the furnace mainly, I, I wasn't concerned that the heat pump won't handle the temperatures, but I kept it for power outages because the furnace takes significantly less to fire up and I can run it off an inverter or generator or something else. And so I plan for that being a backup use case. So here's a list of all the equipment we've, we've installed. Uh, at the time we've done all the upgrades, we also went and took care of the water heater. So listed here are just the, the part numbers and the prices I paid. And at the time it wasn't terribly expensive, but all the numbers are significantly higher now just because of shortages and supply chain issues. Um, next slide. And the other thing I learned at the time that the installer has to be um, necessarily certified to get any kind of uh, incentives. And the guy I used was awesome, but he could not backdate it. He had to be part of the program at the time of the project. And he wasn't. He became later. So uh, here's a separate slide on our water heater. We started with regular tank that became too drafty, too old. We took a detour with the tankless. That proved to be a costly and a painful experience. And this was a very sophisticated recirculating tankless heater that would circulate a little bit of air inside. It had a small tank inside to keep water hot. It was very unreliable, very... It trained us how to behave, basically. You get in the shower, you set temperature, don't touch anything. If you touch it, it'll be... And then it failed very frequently. And then we were very happy when we were doing all the upgrades to put a tank, tank uh, heat pump heater. That one just sits there quietly, it does its job, uh, has an app that tells you what it's doing, and it's been awesome. Uh, next slide. So a bit more details on these. The heat pump water heater, Unlike Navian, unlike my tankless, does not need any exterior air. It uses basement air to extract heat. So it does have a side effect of cooling the basement a little bit because the exhaust is at 32 degrees. So it takes air from basement, hits the water, puts it back in the basement. So the basement gets cooler and drier. It makes a little bit of noise, but it's not terrible. And this is a 50 gallon unit. I run it in heat pump mode. You can also run it in uh, pure electric resistive heating if you need faster response, or you can have a hybrid mode where it switches between them to recover faster. But with three people in our house, this one's been enough. It does not, we've ran out of water once in two years, maybe. Uh, next slide. The app that it comes with actually tells you how much energy it uses. So in a year, we've used 950 kilowatt hours, which is about $130 a year. It's about the same as a gas tank heater, and maybe it's a little more than a tankless. But the reliability and the comfort of this is a little better, and I'm happy not to burn anything. 
Um, it will also message you if it detects a leak as a side effect of having a Wi-Fi connected thing. It throws errors, it pops it on your app. Next. Um, now the, the details of the main system. We kept the furnace. It's a 1995 basic one-speed furnace. Very, very simple. It does work. So what we did, we kept it mainly as an air handler. We took the blower out, put the new one in that has low power ventilation mode. So now I can run it as a constant ventilation for, to keep the house pressurized and, and fresh. We added a way to connect the furnace separately to a generator or an inverter. So I have a little transfer switch just in the furnace and that's my backup. And then we did a lot of ducts upgrade around it. We put a new air cleaner and then the coil got replaced with the heat pump coil, which is just slightly bigger. It dropped in the same place. The ducts had to be tweaked a little bit. And then the outside unit gets replaced. So it effectively looks like you put a new air, air conditioner in. Everything else stayed the same. And then uh, we put a fairly sophisticated thermostat on where you can configure multiple heat sources. So it knows that the house has a furnace, but also knows it has a heat pump. And the way it's configured right now is it has a switchover point where it shuts off heat pump and only uses furnace. Right now it's set to about five degree F. I found below that the heat pump efficiency is low enough where it just doesn't make sense. It runs continuously, but I started losing. So I can't maintain 70. I dropped to like 68 maybe. But so below 5F, uh, heat pump blacks out and the furnace fires up. So far, this year it happened a couple of times. Last couple of years, it hasn't run once. I had to run it by hand manually a couple of times just to maintain it. And then uh, the other improvement we made was because the house is so tight, we made a cheap uh, ERV or HRV energy recovery. Basically, we brought in outside air from a little intake through a little damper that the thermostat opens or closes. And it just goes right into return. They're not doing any fancy energy recovery, but it's just a small damper. And what this does, it brings outside air continuously as long as the outside temperature is within a certain range that's set by a thermostat. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Couple of pictures of the upgrade. So I had a maybe 10-year-old carrier unit. The Bosch unit we put in is not that different. It does go on a little riser to keep. When, when it melts snow and ice in the winter, it needs space for stuff to drain. It's quieter and it's a tiny bit taller. Uh, next. This is the inside. So we went from a small coil to a little bigger coil. And then uh, some of the duct work around it got tweaked a little bit. And you can see on the picture on the right, in the back, on the back left, you can see a little green box that's a switch. It's a transfer switch to go between a generator or a furnace. And the idea was I can take a $200 inverter plus a car battery, plug it in this thing and run for a couple hours. And that, you know, long outage, a couple hours of heat is enough to keep the house safe enough. Uh, next slide. Uh, winter operation, this is a cold weather uh, heat pump. So what it does, it detects when uh, it's starting to form ice on the outside because what, ha what happens, it, it takes air from the sides and blows it up through the heat exchanger. And you can tell it's blowing, as it's generating heat, it's blowing cold air outside. And depending on outside temperature and humidity, you start seeing ice around it. So once it detects ice, it switches direction and becomes an air conditioner. So it takes heat from the house and pumps it into the unit to defrost it. In normal setups, that's when the heat pump turns on electric uh, strip heat, basically resistive heat. So you don't know about this. In my setup, because it's kind of uh, half do-it-yourself configuration, it doesn't. So my house gets air conditioned for five minutes when it runs this. The heat pump tells you when it's doing it, but I didn't like the idea of firing the furnace every time it does it. 
So I didn't. Either way, Igor is an electrical engineer. Yeah. F Y. This is not my. This is not my specialty. This is just a hobby, basically. But uh, so my my family is used to these blasts at the moment. But if it gets too annoying, they might do something about it. I mean, my options are replace the furnace portion with the Bosch air handler that has electric strips and hook it up the proper way. But then I lose the backup or fire the furnace for five minutes, which we can do, but it's too loud, too noisy, nobody likes it. And it, the hot air that blasts is significantly hotter than the heat pump. Heat pump is a lot, a lot more milder. Uh, next slide. So as a summary, we burn very little gas. We've gone a couple of years with none. This year, it's probably going to be, I don't know, five, maybe 10 terms, unfortunately. The side effect of constantly circulating air and bringing fresh air in is we're controlling radon in a basement without doing active mitigation. It's basically a passive mitigation. If the house is pretty tight, I'm pressurizing it. So, And I can tell how well it's working because I have uh, monitors in a couple of places called air sinks wave. They look at radon and a couple other things. And my outside air gets shut off anytime it gets really, really cold. So last couple of weeks when it got to negative temperature in Fahrenheit, my damper would close and then the radon in the basement start going out. Within the day, as soon as the damper opens, the radon goes down. So there is definite connection to that. Uh, and then as far as power consumption, I, I have a house monitor to look at it. And in summer, this thing draws maybe one to two kilowatts. In winter, it's two to four, usually 2.5, 2.9. So your worst case usage is that times 24 hours a day. So you could go up to close to 50 kilowatt hours a day. So that's, if you were to try to figure out how much it would cost to run this thing. So maybe 50 kilowatt hours a day times 14 cents. And then for as long as that really cold streak happens, because the pump doesn't run continuously and when it gets milder, it runs shorter amount of time. It runs maybe 15, 20 minutes every hour. Right now it's in the last couple of weeks, it's been running continuously some of the days. Um, and then the other consideration would be a location. If uh, the outside unit does make a little bit of noise, so, Ideally, you want to locate it not under bedroom windows. That's. Thank you so much, Igor. <laughs> We're on to uh, to Bob. Bob, go ahead and uh, tell us. Sure. Your study. Okay. We can go to the next slide, I guess. Okay, so our house. Um, we have it set up, it's actually a net zero, all electric house, and we have an air source heat pump. So net zero basically means, all, means that all of our home energy needs are supplied by a renewable energy power source on our lot. Uh, specifically, we have solar panels uh, using uh, net metering for our connection to our genie. We're still connected to uh, our genie. And the way this works is throughout the course of the year, we generate a little over 17,000 kilowatt hours. And in the months that we aren't using as much as the system is generating, like late spring through the summer, early fall, we get kilowatt hour credits that can be used in the months that we aren't generating enough to support the house, like right now. And then we use up those credited kilowatt hours. So we have a pretty good balance right now. Uh, we also, I put a note in here, we're charging two electric cars as well. So our electric bill that we receive is 
just for the cost to be connected to our genie. So it's $22 a month. And if we go a little bit over as far as production, then the utility will actually send us a small check for any surplus that we generated. And they, they reconcile that. I think it's like in April or something like that once a year. Um, on the bottom left, you can see our solar panels. In that picture, the original ones we put in in 2008. And then the other four we put in in um, 2018, I believe that was. Okay, next slide. So our house was built in 1986. Uh, the first and second floor is just under 2,500 square feet with uh, the basement um, is 975 square feet. Uh, we have no natural gas service. We're in East Penfield, we're east of Salt Road. And when we built the house, uh, we did some little bit of research. And as far as the insulating qualities of the house, we have R28 in the walls, R50 in the attic. We have triple glazed windows. When they did the layout for the plumbing, electrical, and the heating ducts, none of those items were in any of the exterior walls. So there was no break in any um, thermal insulation in the exterior walls. We insulated the band joists both inside and out. So we started with a pretty efficient um, house in the beginning, knowing that we um, didn't have natural gas here. When we built in 86, we did have a heat pump, uh, but it was a heat pump that would pretty much, pretty much drop off its efficiency if it got below 25 degrees. So back in 1986, the cold climate heat pumps really didn't exist like they like they do now. Uh, next slide. So like I said, our, our solar PV system generates a little over 17,000 kilowatt hours annually. The um, uh, air source heat pump on the left, you can see the outside unit. And then in the middle and the right are the uh, inside units. And um, similar to Igor's system, we have a, a pretty efficient um, air filtering system that was uh, part of the install. And this was installed in August of 2020. So we've had, this will be our second winter with this system. Next slide, please. So the, the air source heat pump was installed by Wise Home Energy. Uh, that's one of the um, partners with um, HeatSmart. Uh, <clears throat> The installation qualified for the NYSERDA rebates plus 0% financing. And I've also installed um, a heat pump water heater and a clothes dryer. You can see the two pictures of those items there. And like I think most of us have done by now, you know, most of the lighting in the house is LED. And through the years replacing appliances, we have 
now all Energy Star appliances. Next slide. So uh, my recommendations um, when it comes to having an all electric home, they can be economical, but it takes planning and time to implement the upgrades for an existing home. Um, I know Igor went through his kind of timeline through the years where he got to where he is today. Um, you know, Al will go through the same thing, Katie. Um, a, and a home energy audit and the proper selection of appliances and uh, the heat pump system will result, result in a cost-effective solution over time. So it's important to investigate the nicer to rebate programs. From time to time, the equipment manufacturers have rebates. And like I mentioned, there's also low or no interest loans available. Next slide, and I think that's it. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Sure. Uh, Katie, you are yes. up for your case study on geothermal. Yes, thank you. So um, about a year and a half ago, we got a geothermal system for our house, which is, was built in 2002. Uh, we were definitely attracted to the efficiency of a geothermal system, and we were excited that it was like an all-in-one, you know, geothermal plus um, uh, electric hot water. And then we were able to cut off our gas supply. That was such a great day. Um, we also got uh, replaced our gas stove with an induction cooktop, which I love, and you should look into it if you're considering it. It's fabulous. Um, and... Um, we starting in December, we uh, were able to do the uh, Penfield 100, which is 100% renewable electricity through the CCA. So um, we are very excited that we've kind of a zero emission house as of now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm going to try to go through this really quickly. We ended up just doing one, one uh, well to 500 feet. And then they dug a trench that was about 30 feet to the house. <clears throat> Next slide. A couple weeks later, they came back, uh, they buried the tube six feet under the ground. The tubes got connected to the utility room. We installed um, the exact same thing that Al is gonna tell you about. So I'm actually gonna skip that entirely. Um, and then I was excited to hear that the heat was off for 30 minutes total, which was great because it was a very cold day. And then they did a touchscreen thermostat with Wi-Fi uh, accessibility. All right, next slide. And then we were able to turn off the gas. That was so exciting. Um, it, that made me so, so happy. I clicked my heels for sure. And then a few weeks later, we also were able to get a Symphony temperature control app. So that's been great because we had uh, we came home early from vacation just a few weeks ago for Christmas, and we had it set to vacation mode. But from the highway, I was able to say, you know, kick that heat on, so we have a nice toasty house when we get home. That was, and it's it's been great actually for the data analysis. I'm I love looking at the data, and you can see exactly how much energy you're using month to month and what, you know, which types of uh, heat is it heat one, heat two, or the auxiliary heat. Um, that's been, it's been great. So next slide, please. Here's the cost breakdown. The initial quote was over 41,000, which is hefty, but it quickly came down with a nicer to rebate rebate, which we didn't even see. So that the actual out of pocket cost was 32,750, but then we did get that uh, tax credit last year. So the cost, total cost after incentives was 24,350. And like Matt said, you know, that's expensive, um, but the idea is that the operating cost is gonna be um, significantly less over the lifetime of the system. And so um, we should see a return on investment eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Al, next slide. 
So, so one major problem that we've had, which will not happen to you, um, we the 500 foot well was a major problem. Uh, there's no way to know exactly where gas pockets exist. And we were told that we might hit a gas pocket and they're variable and, you know, the vent, the well might vent for two days, maybe even as long as two weeks. And uh, the neighbors might be a little upset. It'll be a little stinky, but it was awful and it's much better, but it's still venting all this time later. It's been a year and a half. So uh, next slide, please. It was really bad those first few days. I mean, we had neighbors, we had people calling from two neighborhoods over be reporting a gas leak. It was, it was so strong. It was so much gas. Um, the fire marshal insisted eventually uh, after like the third time coming out that they put the tube up, the extended tube up above the height of the house. Um, it stayed like that throughout the whole winter. Um, <laughs> And we would love to convince our neighbors to go geothermal, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, ACEs will never go past 250 feet again. So it, at least in Penfield. Um, and uh, um, so this will not, we, you know, we're an early adopter and we will suffer this for you. <laughs> okay. So um it's now shorter. It's about eight feet. And, um, but yeah, we still have little stinky poops every couple minutes being outside. And it's really, really disappointing to say the very least. All right, next slide. So we're very sad about the venting. Um, methane gas is far worse than carbon dioxide. And we know it won't happen to other pen fielders, but oh, okay. But we love the system inside that, you know, that aside, it's great. And, um, and it's so much more efficient. We do heat more than we would in the winter and we cool more than we would in the summer. Uh, and, um, and, it, and we have been running the numbers. Uh, if you convert the therms to kilowatt hours, it really is um, four times the efficiency of a gas fired furnace that was consistent um, all last winter. And then last summer was just too cold. So I can't, I can't say for sure that it was a six X efficiency for the AC. Um, but we only used 172 kilowatt hours the whole for over four months of the summer to cool our house. Um, and it's a 3,300 square foot house. And, uh, but we do, uh, we are frugal with our, our heating, uh, our cooling. We only, we set the house to 80 degrees and, um, and eventually, or occasionally we bump it down to 78. Um, we do have a little bit of a concern about power outage, but not Really, although we are um, looking at um, getting Bob Knauer to install a um, battery system for us, a battery backup that would power our uh, heating, cooling, and uh, some lights and the refrigerator. So that is our story. Okay, Katie, thank you so much. I just want to let you know we're running about five, seven minutes over here. Uh, I'm going to try to to speed up my presentation, but we may be a couple of minutes. If, if all of you, if any of you have a hard stop, we honor that. And uh, I'll stop at um, 8.30 for sure to see if there's any more. So I'm Al Hibner in Penfield. And guess what? I benefited from Katie's disaster with, they only drilled six 100 foot wells in my house. <laughs> no gas. <laughs> we were not drilling for gas, Katie. <laughs> okay. I have a 1955 ranch home, obviously never insulated when it was built. Who cared back in 55, 1500 square feet upper. And this is a basement level, um, a walkout basement in-law apartment, not insulated properly. So I'm going to do something about that even, even more. And our contractor was also ACES Geothermal. It was about six months after uh, Katie had her system installed. So let's get to it. Here's my timeline. And I do want to urge you, if you are interested in seeing how in a backyard with a mobile drilling rig, small two-man, two-person operation, drilling six wells, I, if you go to the appendices of this Power, PowerPoint PDF, you can click on links to see videos of the, the wells being dug, 
the trenches being trenched in and, and all of that. So there is uh, in my blog articles, an amazing amount of detail and, and videos about how a geothermal system is installed. Welcome and urge you to, to go see that. Now, we all have timelines. There's, there's a commonality there. I'm not going to trouble you with all of the timeline uh, items before April of this past year. I do want to focus in on the geothermal system. So as Katie said, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on the, on the system. Uh, and as the question was answered, asked by Jody and uh, Chris earlier, um, what you're seeing here is a water furnace series seven installed exactly where the old gas furnace was, pulled right out and installed right into the ductwork. No problems, easy peasy, <laughs> okay. So that's the unit. Uh, um, and we also had, now I have a little side room next to it. Uh, there was, used to be a, a, a gas water heater right next to our furnace but we need a little bit more room because I have two tanks. I'll talk about that in a second. So I have um, Ale Smith Voltex hybrid hot water heater, same unit Katie, Katie had. And um, the, the cool thing about this system is I have something called a desuperheater. Now the, the compressor inside the water furnace, you know, when it's running at, a, at, at the highest speeds, higher speeds, it's, it's generating a fair amount of heat. It runs about 3000 uh, kilowatts, 3000, I'm sorry, 3000 watts at the highest speeds and tapering down to 500 at the lowest speeds, 500 watts. So why waste that heat? Let's grab it. So the, the, the superheater is a loop around the compressor, picks up that waste heat, sends it to a passive 50 gallon water heater. This does not hook up to anything. And that's where the water is coming in from the street. So 50 degree water coming in from the street goes into that passive tank. It's mixed with preheated preheated water from the water furnace, the superheater. And then when we call for heat, heated water from a bath, shower, or whatever, from the uh, A.O. Smith unit, it's, it, it's taking preheated water from that geotank. It is an amazingly efficient system. I mean, how does it get any better? I'm, I'm gonna call this system the Tesla, the finest, uh, consumer residential home heating and cooling system that exists. And if you look at our pricing, we were a little bit higher than Katie. Well, let me tell you why. So she had one big truck drill, one big 500 foot well. Oops, the Katie, sorry. <laughs> Took a couple days. I had a crew of two gentlemen running a mini drill rig, drilling six wells, two and a half weeks it took. So yeah, it's going to be a teeny bit more expensive. And uh, they, when they did the trenching, they went right through the uh, leach field. But who cares? Because we're not using the leach field, so, as I told you that earlier. Here's a project overview. We did have a couple problems, but they were very minor. The A.O. Smith hybrid hot water heater, the compressor failed. Big deal. Under warranty. They replaced the unit. Boom. Done. And then there was one pipe that was not properly connected. So we had a little bit of leaking water in the water furnace, and they fixed that. Mm, just... Just took a little time to fix that. No problem. Uh, excellent service from them. <clears throat> Lots of pictures that you can see in those, uh, those articles. So what do I do about backup? Well, look, at, my wife and I are 71 years old. We are aging in place. We're going to be here in this house in Penfield for a couple more decades. No apologies. No apologies. We've installed, we had to harden our electrical infrastructure. I went ahead and installed a 200 amp breaker box because, hey, we're all electric. Geez, the EV charger grabs 7,000 watts when I charge it from 9, p 9 p.m. to 7 a.m., 7,000 watts an hour, okay, for an EV charger to start. I put a whole house surge protector in the panel. I install a Generac 22 kilowatt uh, generator. I don't care. <laughs> it's comfort, baby. We're 71 years old. We're aging in place. No apologies. Man, if we get a power outage, this thing kicks over and runs on natural gas and we generate more than enough power to run every single thing in this house. In fact, bring your space heaters over and we'll heat them up. Okay. So the only reason we're keeping natural gas service right now is to run the generator. It runs five minutes a week, uh, 52 weeks a year for, for uh, testing itself. So again, no apologies. 
The other thing that I had Bob Knauer do is install a unit called Sense. And Sense allows me to, using artificial intelligence, to determine the amount of watts being used by every single electrical device in my house, including I have a space heater here, the carrier uh, air source heat pump behind me, um, water furnace gives me all the electrical usage uh, of its own uh, components. So the only reason I put this sense is so I can track and give you real numbers, which are coming, real numbers are coming, You, because I know inquiring minds want to know the real numbers. I know you do. <laughs> okay. So here's some real numbers. Back in June, the first uh, last five days of June were the hottest of the summer. Little, uh, little glimpse at global warming down the road, 10, a couple of decades from now. Maybe that's our normal temperatures in the summer. Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, the average temperature high was 90.6. The average temperature over 24 hour period for those five days was 81 degrees. The, here's the number of cooling degree days. That is the difference between the average temperature and 65. It goes either way, heating or cooling. This, wet, this uh, data is courtesy of the uh, weather.gov site. And here's the usage. Each day we average nine kilowatt hours to cool 2,200 square feet down to 73 degrees, 60, 16 hours a day and set back a 71 at night. Just absolute comfort for these old bones, 71 year old bones, okay? So, I mean, we, this, this proves Saul Griffith. You can have your cake and eat it too. So for a buck 17 a day, 35 bucks a month, if it was averaging 90.6 as high temperature, 81 degrees as average temperature. That's amazing. That's amazing numbers. But wait, there's more. Um, a couple of days ago, I recorded the data uh, for the entire month of January. I now have eight months worth of data. So let's look at it. The average maximum temperature over that eight month period nine month period, excuse me, including two months of winter, 63, the average temperature degrees across 24 hour periods, 54. And that's actually pretty close to average, about half a degree above average. So here's the heating and cooling uh, degree days. Now, if you look at January, we had 1,407 heating degree days, way, way over average. So January was a cold month. Higer, I don't blame your gas furnace for turning on. <laughs> We had a lot of days with minus seven degrees at night. Remember that? We had at least two or three of those. So here's the usage. Now I'm in an I'm in an uninsulated basement. I'm going to do something about that. I've, I've got a contract with Wise Home Energy Services to see what I can do down here and a couple other places in my home to get some more um, uh, weatherization going. So I have a space heater because it sits right next to me and keeps me warm when it's like five degrees outside. Okay, I have a carrier mini split that warms it up in the morning. And then I have the water furnace for the upstairs and part of part of this space down here. So blended, I'm able to track the exact kilowatt hour usage of everything that heats my home to the to the one hundredth of a kilowatt hour. So here's the cost. Okay, over nine months, I've spent three hundred ninety two dollars to heat to seventy three to 70 degrees during 16 hours of the day, because we're home most of the day, averaging 43.57 a month to heat and cool our 22 square hundred feet home, part of which is uninsulated because you have concrete walls behind that paneling or concrete block walls. So that those are numbers that surprised me. I had no idea they were going to be that good. We've got one more month really of hard winter in February. So th that's going to creep up a little bit, but if it goes to $50 a month across the entire year, uh, $600 to heat and cool this home to the, the levels that we're at, that ain't bad. That's not bad. So if you look at the, the two winter months here, and I invite you to examine these numbers, these are absolutely accurate numbers from kilowatt hour usage from our systems. So looks pretty good so far, folks. I'm pretty happy. So some closing thoughts and lessons to take you home here. We're going to be about five minutes over. If you have to go at 830, we don't blame you. Uh, so we banished a gas to the practice squad like the uh, like the quarterback, the backup quarterback. 
Gas is there just to practice a little bit once a week and then come off the bench when we need it for a power outage. We have a shaded roof uh, for trees, both neighbor and ours. We can't have solar panels and batteries. And my wife and I, again, we're aging in place. We're not climate austerity nuts. We're climate preppers, not doomsday preppers, climate preppers. Uh, and we keep the temperatures reasonable. Uh, Katie manages at 80. Nah, nah, nah. We're going to be at 73 in, <laughs> in the summertime because we have old bones. Okay. So no compromises required. Like Saul Griffith said, the geothermal system allows us to have our cake and eat it too. And my battery is way, way bigger than your battery. Okay. The backyard, six wells, space 10 feet apart about 21 by 63 by 102 feet deep. That's 5,000 cubic meters. The loop temperature varies between 59 degrees. Uh, when it's pumping a lot of cool into the house, it goes up to 59. Steady state is 49.1. And I've seen it go down when it was seven below. I saw it go down to 32 degrees. But that's only temporary because if you turn the system off, it just regenerates. It comes right back to 49. Uh, that's that's called entropy. It is a physical principle of, of heat traveling. <laughs> okay, and we it's just an unlimited source of supply of heat energy. And uh, would you rather have a 32 degree loop temperature versus a seven below? So much easier for the unit to make heat from 32 degrees or 39 degrees or 49 degrees than it is to make it from minus five degree air when it shuts off like uh, Igor's has to do with an air source. So enough bragging. We passed our own Build Back Better Act. We've invested in our system. Uh, I'm, I'm less concerned about return on investment because, hey, it, we deserve it. We're 71. We're retired. Uh, we're going to live here. I have no concern about returning on investment. I know where fuel, fossil fuel prices are going. Nowhere but up. This will pay for itself. We get fixed electricity prices with our CCA program. So I have no issues at all. Uh, bottom line, this is such a cool system. It has 12 speeds, 12 compressor speeds, 12 fan speeds. How many speeds does your furnace have? Ha! Huh? Okay. So it, it ratchets up and down speeds all day. I can tell the temperature outside based on the speed of the compressor and the fan. Literally, I've, I've now come to understand in the morning, it's going to be running at 11 compressor speed and maybe eight fan speed. And by the time it heats up, warms up to say 39 degrees, it'll be running at one compressor speed and three fan speed. So uh, it's pretty cool. The heating cycle, the vents, uh, heat ducts don't heat up to more than 90 degrees. That keeps it cool. Uh, basically, the, the lower temperatures at the register keep the humidity higher. And it runs constantly in the coldest weather. So you're always staying very constant with your temperature, plus or minus two tenths of a degree. It's just built for comfort. This is a Tesla system, the Water Furnace Series 7. I'm sold on it. I uh, hope you buy one too. So uh, incredible, priceless. Uh, we're not burning a single cubic foot of natural gas. If you look at the white pipes on the left, they're capped. That was the old exhaust pipes for my old furnace. No more CO2 emissions for me, all gone. The black pipes are coming in from the backyard from that beautiful big brown battery, 5,000 cubic yards. We are now powered by 100% renewable energy. And when the uh, uh, hybrid dryer, electric dryer is installed in, in early February, I will be 100% all electric. And if you catch a theme here with the people that are talking to you tonight, that's a theme, going all electric, decarbonizing 100%. That's a theme, it feels. Awfully good. Thank you, ACES. Even Mother Nature approves. That that uh, that shrub there did not. Uh, we did not trim that after the loop field in the spring. After it was looking over the loop field, and Mother Nature grew it into a beautiful big green heart to give us kudos. A shout out from Mother Nature to the Hibner family. So um, we are basically our our gas meter is very lonely. You know, we're only going to use a few therms a year to run the test the generator each week. And uh, that's my that's my story. Any any quick questions? Sorry, I ran over, but that's my story. Anybody have any questions? OK, 
Uh, lastly, Matt, if you wanna if you wanna talk about next steps before we finish up. Sure. So uh, I would recommend everybody get a home energy audit. Um, it's pretty easy to do. Um, we can uh, I can help you get started with a company that makes sense for you. Um, all you have to do is sign up at the Heat Smart website. Again, totally free. Um, we don't have any incentive to try to sell you anything. I just want to help you make a good decision for you. <clears throat> so totally get in touch. And if you wanted to help out with, you know, uh, the effort in Penfield, um, help your town earn those uh, points and um, grant dollars, uh, it's, uh, I can help you get to a stage where you feel comfortable, um, you know, talking to your neighbors and friends about it. Uh, I run a Heat Smart Ambassador training every few months or so. We just had one in January, so the next one will be in April. Um, but uh, yeah, you can register for that next session. It doesn't have a date yet, but if you click that link, you can put your name down and I will contact you when I schedule that in the next couple months. So, so why don't we have, why don't you stop making heat with fossil fuels and start moving heat because it feels a whole lot better to move heat versus make heat, which is a waste of energy and it's it's polluting with CO2 emissions. So thank you. Thank you for letting us go over six minutes and 45 seconds. I appreciate it. Any last thoughts or questions from any of you before we uh, close out for the evening? Any comments? Hope you enjoyed this. I will be following up emailing all of you the PDF document with, with all the links uh, and the articles that I've written and so forth, links to those as well. So any questions, comments? All right, well, we thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us.